stand to your feet with me. We're going to get ready to read and honor God's word wherever you are joining and watching from. We are in the midst of a series called the Leadership Challenge. Say it with me. The Leadership Challenge challenge. We are going through the book of Nehemiah. We kicked it off last week online. How many of y'all were able to watch that online? Hopefully a bunch of y'all. We kicked it off online last week. If you missed it, encourage you to check it out. It will help provide context. But here is the situation. Nehemiah lives in the midst of a world in crisis. He is in exile. There are enemies on every side. There is dissension. There is division. There is a temptation to lose all hope. And in the midst of the chaos in God's redemptive plan, which he does, does over and over and over again, God calls a leader to rebuild. Let me do a little comprehension check. How many of you are leaders? Show of hands. Show of hands. Okay, if you're not raising your hand, you missed last week. How many of you are human beings? Raise your hand. Congratulations. You are, some of y'all didn't raise your hand, and I have no idea what to think about that. Greetings, earthlings. Preach the good news to every creature. Um, we're just going to keep rolling with it. If you are a human being, you, 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 you've got to lead somebody. You've got to, maybe you'll lead five. Maybe you'll lead 500. Maybe you'll lead your family. Maybe you'll lead in your business. Maybe the only person you've got to lead is yourself. Say, Jesus, help me, right? The hardest leadership we have to do most of the time. But I made the case last week that we are all called to lead. It is not an if, but a who and a how. And we want to lead well. God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, God's plan. Last week, we focused on God's burden and God's heart. This week, I want to jump into God's vision and God's plan. So if you'll flip to Nehemiah chapter 2, we're going to jump into this thing. And if you're ready, say, let's do this. Oh, I'm excited to jump in. By the way, NFL Draft is happening next week. All right, Miami Dolphin fans, how we feeling? How we feeling? We're a little, yeah, I know we're sitting pretty with all these draft picks, but if there's ever a franchise that can figure out a way to mess it up, we are that franchise. God have mercy. Chapter two, here we go. In the month, I just had to, you know, football, you know. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, there's a name, when wine was brought for him, why is that important? Because you remember last week, Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah learns that, that his city, Jerusalem, his people lie in ruins. The walls are broken down, destroyed by fire. Nehemiah is in exile at this elevated position, and he hears of this, and he mourns, and he prays, and he fasts, and then he realizes at the end, wait a second, I'm the cupbearer to the king. See, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence before. We're not ancient world people, so you're like, what a random detail. It's not a random detail. Why has Nehemiah not been sad in the king's presence before? Because if you are sad, you are dead. You had one job, make the king happy. I had never been sad in the king's presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look sad? You are not ill. This can be nothing but sadness of heart. You have anybody in your life that talks like that? Kind of weird, but we love them. Nehemiah said, I was very much afraid. Now you understand why. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. And hopefully me too. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried, it lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And the king said to me, what is it you want? That's a crucial question. Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long is your journey going to take? When will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they'll provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And can I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that it will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. Everybody say plan. Buddy had a plan. And because the gracious hand of God was on me, the king granted my request. Let's pray. Jesus... You are the good shepherd, and you are the best leader. Disciple us this morning. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Give your neighbor an air high five. Tell him, get ready. Tell him, get ready. You ever had a passion without a plan? 
Anybody there online, can you, can you track with me? You ever had great ambitions and high hopes only to realize, I'm not quite sure how we're going to make this thing happen. Ever been there? I remember in college, I went to the University of Florida, God's favorite college town, Go Gators. Uh, not the point. I just got to put that out there. I'm sorry, JC, but someday you'll repent and turn to the orange and blue. And, um, and I remember actually Kayla and I were in the friend, same friend circle, Kayla, who you saw lead worship. And um, we decided we were going to go camping. Now, we were all excited about this camping trip, and it was going to be amazing. And, and so we grabbed some tents, and we're like, we're going to go camping in Georgia. It, it was right around fall time, and so we're like, this is going to be so great. Um, now, the problem is most of us, or a good, good majority of us, were from South Florida. Now, our fall in South Florida is not exactly like fall as you move for, further north. Our fall is like, we're like, well, we're going to see the leaves, and it's going to be so great. And so we got some tents, and we got some supplies, and we were relatively prepared, but did not not really have a good plan in place. Fast forward, we're there. It's beautiful. It's incredible as long as it's daytime and the sun is out. Then we get in our tents and there was a little cold snap that went through. And, and so our idea of South Florida fall quickly became falling temperatures of below freezing. It's in the 20s. It's in the teens. And by like midnight, we're all like <laughs> in our little Florida tents. Like, I think we might die. Kid you not, we spent the, the entirety of the evening in our cars with the heat on, rolled up in every piece of clothing we had brought in, asking Jesus to keep us alive life. This was our camping experience. Kayla, am I lying? I'm not, I'm not lying. She reminded me of the terror of this moment. The next day, though, it was great because we met some random strangers who said, come over our house. You can stay there. And we we're like, great. And we stayed with random strangers. It didn't turn out as sketchy as it probably could have. In retrospect, I was like, God have mercy. We had a passion, but man, did we lack a plan. Now, if we're not careful, maybe you're like, oh my gosh, Pastor John, how did you even survive? The more stories I hear, the more I'm like, the mercy of God is clearly on your life. Yes. But also, if we're being honest and circumspect, we are a people like this, and we are immersed in a culture like this. Big passion with no plan. Big passion with no plan, at least not a divine one. Last week, we talked about God's burden God's heart, God's vision, God's plan, that great leaders, kingdom leaders, servant leaders get God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, and God's plan. Say it with me. God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, God's plan. And if we're going to become the servant leaders that God created us to be, if we're going to follow in the footsteps of, of biblical leaders like Nehemiah at our jobs and in our homes and with our classmates and our coworkers and our constituents, because it you know, alliteration, um, we are going to need all four of these things. God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, God's plan. I want to continue to see this fleshed out here in Nehemiah chapter 2. I've got one big idea or core thought for the morning. If you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to jot this one down. By the way, one of the best things you can do for your learning comprehension based off of psychology is to take notes. So if you're like, why do you always talk about taking notes? I'm trying to help you all out, all right? Take some notes. Here's the big idea. Great leadership starts with a burden, becomes clear with a vision, and becomes doable with a plan. Great leadership starts with a burden, becomes clear with a vision, and becomes doable with a plan. Let me jump here and we'll see this fleshed out in Nehemiah chapter 2. Let's start with the first point. Great leadership starts with a burden. It starts with a burden. If you're remembering, if you're watching online this week, you'll remember that last week we really camped on this point in a significant and focused way that, that if we're going to step out and be used by God to make significant, sweeping, lasting change by the grace of God in our context, then a burden is necessary. Great leadership, it starts with a burden. Passion is great. It must begin here. Now, I need to clarify if we're talking about leadership it is a burden for people, all right? This is not like, yeah, Pastor John, I've got a burden to get out of debt in 1.7 years. I've got a burden to make a bunch of money. It's like, okay, that's not necessarily bad, but that's not what I'm talking about when it comes to leadership. When it comes to leadership, I'm talking about a burden for people. I would argue that until you have passion and compassion for people, you are not ready to lead people. Anybody had a boss that treated them like a number? You know how gross that feels. See, it starts with a burden. Now, I think most of our culture in our current moment is here. We live in a culture that is thoroughly and heavily burdened. 
In fact, we live in a culture right now, maybe you've heard this word, maybe your friends have tossed this out, maybe you've tossed it out yourself. We live in a culture of deconstruction. We live in a culture that is very in tune with the calling out of things that need to be torn down. In fact, we say things in our cultural mantra like, man, we're going to call out hypocrisy. We're going to lift our voice. We're going to be a voice to the voiceless. We're going to raise our voice against oppression, all of which are good and, if we're doing it the right way, godly, biblical things. But I need us to understand something crucial. That is the easy part. That's the easy part. See, often, if we're not careful, last week I I tossed out one of the questions from the sermon. What breaks your heart? You remember this from last week? What breaks your heart? Trying to get in tune with, God, what are you stirring in me? And if we're not careful, we often stop at very general answers. Abortion breaks my heart. Racism breaks my heart. Homelessness breaks my heart. Human trafficking breaks my heart. Unreached people groups break my heart. And so it's like, okay, all right, so what are you going to do about it? I I know. I'm going to post on social media. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Let me just be clear. That's not leadership. That's not leadership. That's a great starting point, but that is not leadership. See, here's the danger. We live in the midst of a culture of deconstruction with no vision for reconstruction. We live in the culture of deconstruction. We're like, that's wrong. Tear it down. That's wrong. Get it out. That's wrong. God's against that. And it's like, okay, amen. What are we going to do? I don't know. Oh, no. And you know what that's called? You know what it's called when you just tear something down and leave it there? That's called a wrecking ball. You know how much skill it takes to be a wrecking ball? None. None. Is it needed? Sometimes. But if all you do is tear stuff down with no vision like a Nehemiah to build stuff up, you are not a Nehemiah in the story. Let me be clear. You are a Nebuchadnezzar because that's what he did tore down the walls, burned them with fire, and said, y'all figure it out, peace, I'm out. See, I, I, I feel like we're in this interesting, latent with potential and full of danger moment where a Nehemiah moment with a shortage of Nehemiah is willing to press in and get God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, and God's plan. I want to go back to last week. I want to ask you a question when it comes to the burden. What is the problem? What is the problem that 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 burden God is stirring on your heart? What's what's the problem that this this thing that's keeping you up at night, that as you pray and spend time with God, it keeps popping up in your head? What's the problem that you're addressing? Get specific and then be ready, like Nehemiah, to answer the question, what are you requesting? Because to be clear, the vast majority of our reconstruction movement in our current or deconstruction movement in our current day and age has no clue in regard to the answer to that question. Here's what I'm getting at, a a passion, a burden. Leadership starts with a burden. It's a solid starting point, but it is not enough. It, in fact, does not mean anything if you don't move on to vision. Passion, it's, it's, it's the easy stuff. It's the natural stuff. It's a necessary starting point, and it's where we begin, but it comes very easily to us. It does not take any effort. Here's what I'm trying to get to. Any random drunk person can come through a room and tear stuff down. Are you all tracking with me here? Like, that does not take any prophetic unction or skill. It's like, well, you want me to get on this thing and knock stuff down? I can do that. It takes a leader to build a building. And what we see in Nehemiah is a heartbroke burden. I'm calling out what's happening, but he does not stop there. Why? Because the redemptive work, begins with a vision and a plan. If all we're doing in our moment, and I fear that is the danger, if all we're doing in our moment when it comes to leadership is deconstructing, it does not take an architect, and it does not take a visioneer, and it doesn't even necessarily take God. It just takes a wrecking ball. And if we're not careful, we will start and stop at passion. And the need is so much greater. God is calling us to rebuild. Nehemiah didn't stop there. Great leadership, it starts with a burden, but it becomes clear with a vision. Everybody say vision. Say vision. Say chazon. You're like, what language is that? That's tongues. No, I'm just playing. It's Hebrew. It's vision. It begins 
with a burden, but he becomes clear with a vision. Point number two, if you're taking notes, great leaders seek God for a compelling vision. Great leaders seek God for a compelling vision. See, leaders do not just feel it deeply, they see it clearly. This is vital. If we're talking leadership, if we're looking at biblical examples, great leaders don't just feel it deeply. They have to start there. Otherwise, it's just perfunctory. You're just going through the motions. They don't just feel it deeply, although they start there. They also see it clearly. Let me give you an example. This is from our vision statement. We go through this during Activate. So if you haven't joined, man, come hang with us. But in some of our core documents, it says, we are a movement of generosity. In a culture held captive by greed, we renounce the idolatry of materialism and embrace the call to give of ourselves and our possessions. Right? Wow. I remember, you know, almost 20 years ago when we were crafting this and, and we were wordsmithing this and then we were looking at the research and we got a burden. We're like, just so you guys know, the, the average Christian gives about 2.58% of their income away to charitable causes and to make a difference. I think that's a tragedy in our modern context. And out of that 2.58%, the average church gives about 2%, which means that followers of Jesus who have been redeemed and rescued from sin and acknowledge that everything we have is God's give about 2% of 2% away. We were like, that's not right. We had a burden. We crafted some of this language. It's like, yeah, yeah. And I remember Pastor Mike coming in and, and we had this deacon meeting. We're gathered around. And we got some of this language. He came in and said, hey guys, I've been praying. I want us to pray and fast through this, but I feel like we're supposed to be shooting for 50%. And the whole room was like, whoo. <laughs> All of a sudden, the general burden of, yeah, man, it, it, radical generosity, yeah, let's do that, amen. Just like theoretical, like, yeah. And then you drop a number, a clear vision, like 50%, and everyone was like, oh, oh we really mean this, I guess. We're actually going to do something. Why? All of a sudden, it got real because there was a clear vision. See, vision is an answer to the problem. Vision is an answer to the problem. A great thing to jot down right now in your notes are what problem are you solving? Do you know how many answers are concocted that solve a problem that does not exist? And they were like, no one cares. It's like, no, it just wasn't an issue to begin with. What problem are you solving? This was crystal clear for Nehemiah. Look at this. Let's jump back into the story. Nehemiah says, man, I hadn't been sad in the king's presence ever before. And, and so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad? Why are you you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness. And Nehemiah was afraid. Re remember what's at stake here. He realizes I could lose my job. I could lose my income. I could lose my family. Nehemiah is in exile, and he's been elevated to one of the highest servant positions he could have. He's got a great job. He's got a solid paycheck. His family's set. He realizes not only could I lose it all, not only could my family suffer shame, I could be dead right here. But Nehemiah says, King, live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Check this out. That took guts. That took courage. And then the king responds, what is it you want? What is it you want? Nehemiah felt the burden, but it was so clear to Nehemiah that he had crafted. It's almost like he had his elevator pitch planned in advance. It was so clear for Nehemiah that the king, he has the, 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 the spiritual audacity to step in and, and give God a shot to move. And when the king's like, what's going on? He's able to cast a vision that's clear and to articulate it in a way that was compelling enough for the king that he moved on it. You're like, how, how do you know it was clear and compelling? Well, quite frankly, because the king didn't kill him. That's how we know. Like, that's kind of where the pedal meets the metal. The king doesn't kill him. I, I need us to pause in this moment and realize this. Uh, in a lot of sectors, and a lot of circles right now, it is very appealing to be like, yeah, leadership. I want to be a leader. And some of you are like, I don't know. But, you know, and, and, and this is where we see in Scripture the honest assessment from, from God in Scripture here in Nehemiah. We see it from Jesus as well. Leadership comes at a cost. There is a risk. If there is a problem that is being addressed, there is a risk associated with that problem. Jesus said things like, hey, listen, don't, he said, go follow me. People are like, yeah, I'll do it. He's like, ah, first sit down and count the cost. You're not going to build a tower and, uh, until you step back and realize if you have enough materials and wherewithal to finish that tower. See, leadership is going to cost you. The king turns around and says to him, what is it, what is it that you want? 
Nehemiah says, then I prayed to the God of heaven, verse 4. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. This, this is not some like uh, the king's asking him a question. Nehemiah's like, God, let me do like some awkward non sequitur. This is one of those, if you've ever prayed one of those under your breath, God, please help me. Jesus, let me survive. Like you ever prayed one of those like heart level? It's not some formal, Father God, Lord, blessed prayer. It's like one of those, Jesus, help me. This is his Jesus help me prayer for survival, favor. God, don't let him cut my head off right now. Like he prays to the God of heaven and he answers the king. If it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of J in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild. Great leadership, it starts with a burden, but it becomes clear with a vision. Nehemiah has this moment to share the burden. He steps out in courage. The king follows up and says, all right, what is it that you want? And Nehemiah has an answer ready. He doesn't just post something like, man, this is horrible. We got to tear it down. Okay, what should we do? I don't know. Nehemiah has an answer. He has an answer. And if we want to lead like Nehemiah, it's not just settling for any vision. Our call is to get a vision from God. You remember from last week what Nehemiah did first? He gets a report from Jerusalem. The city's broken down. The walls are burned with fire. What's the first thing Nehemiah does? He prays. He fasts. He gets with God. He gets God's burden. He gets God's heart. And what we're seeing here is apparently he's gotten God's vision and his plan as well. Here's what I want you to do. If you watched last week, I asked you to start a note on your phone. I want you to pull out your phone in church. You could do it right now online in the room. I want you to pull out your phone if you started that note from last week. And I want you to go back to the question that I had you jot down. What breaks your heart? If you don't have a note from last week, you could just write down what breaks your heart. And then underneath that, I want you to write this. What problem are you solving? What breaks your heart? What problem are you solving? Oh, that's kind of cool. Backdrop music. I like that. And we're going to take, I want you to take some time this week to kind of press into that idea and go a little further with it. Great leadership starts with a burden. It becomes clear with a vision. And it becomes doable with a plan. You can hang on to that note because you're going to use it in just a second here. Just don't text your friend because God sees you, all right? Great leaders, I'm just playing, but also for real. Uh, great leaders seek God for a clear plan. Great leaders seek God for a clear plan. Again, jumping back into the story of Nehemiah, since the vision was so clear for Nehemiah, he was able to articulate it in a way that was also compelling to the king. In fact, the king leans in here and wants to know more. Look at this in verse 6. Nehemiah goes ahead and tells them, hey, I want to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild, to restore. Verse 6, then the king with the queen sitting beside him, this is interesting, asked me, Okay, well, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It, let me kind of get into the story a little bit with you because this is a real story that really happened about a real leader in history and how God really used him in incredible ways. Nehemiah gets this burden. We know from scripture, in fact, that, that what he ends up doing is he takes a while to camp on this thing. We look at the story of Nehemiah and we're like, oh man, this is, you know, he, he gets a burden and then he's like, he, he goes and does it. What we know, in fact, is that the, the time frame that has passed from chapter one, what we heard about last week, and chapter two, what we're talking about this morning, is four months. We're told what Jewish months it was in. So we know empirically it was four months. So for four months, Nehemiah hears this bad news, and what does he do? He goes to God, he fasts, and he prays. This is not what our microwave culture wants to hear. What we want is like, man, you feel a burden in the moment? Just go out and do something. Well, what have you done? You've done something rash. And then, God forbid, someone is moved, and they ask you the question, oh, yeah, yeah, I hear you. All right, what's the plan? You're like, oh, did you Here's what I need to understand. If all Nehemiah is, is a deconstructionist, he does not survive this encounter. He has the audacity, I would argue, I'm reading between the lines a little bit here, but four months of prayer and fasting, and I'm guessing at some point, God says, go. We know that he was not sad before the king before, because the king says... You've never been sad before me before. So, so he has not been sad month one, month two, month three, month four. Four months in, God says, go. So Nehemiah gets up there and he lets his face go droopy. 
Now, I, I would argue there's some absolute strategery here. I don't even know if that's a real world, but we're well with it. There's some strategery here on behalf of Nehemiah because he waits, we learn, until wifey was in the room, until Bay was in the room. I almost picture King Artaxerxes, he's watching this go down, and he's kind of like, he's almost like flexing. You know, if he was alone, maybe he just would have wiped him out right there. But he kind of wants to show his wife that he's, you know, he's, he's an understanding leader that, that is empathically aligned with the people of his time period. And so I almost picture him with a smirk like, you know, Nehemiah sat. He's like, bro, what are you doing? Like, do you know? And then he sees his wife. He's like, I mean, what is wrong? You never tried to do the flex in front of your spouse before? No. You guys are really godly, apparently. Um, but this is him kind of like showing off. And he's like, oh, what do you want, Nehemiah? And Nehemiah's like, well, actually, and he has an answer. Probably saved his life. And then the king goes one step, one step further, and he says, okay, I see you want to go to Jerusalem. And I almost picture him with a smirk turning around and being like, so how long is he going to take, buddy boy? All right, big guy. Like, wow, look at the chutzpah on this guy. That's a Yiddish word. Like, wow, look at the moxie on this guy. Like, wow, okay, all right, buddy. What's the plan? And Nehemiah has a plan. Nehemiah wasn't a shoot first and aim second leader. Nehemiah had a plan. In fact, Nehemiah has a very specific plan. The king's like, how long is it going to take? Nehemiah's like, well, actually, now that you mention it, um, I'm going to need some letters to the governor of the Trans-Euphrates. Uh, I'm going to need safe conduct to Judah. I'm going to need a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park. I'm going to need timber. You know, the citadel, the walls, the temple, obviously my home, uh, dwelling place. And I'm just going to be back. And the king's like, oh, 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 I think the king got way more than he bargained for. Like, what the king was expecting is what we have largely called leadership in our moment, which is just, I'm pissed and everyone else is going to hear about it. And Nehemiah does his thing, and the king's like, oh, okay, big boy, what you got going on? He's like, well, actually, I want to go ahead and go to Jerusalem, and I want because the walls are broken down. He's like, okay, I wasn't anticipating that. Uh, well, what's, how long is it going to take? Nehemiah's like, well, actually, now that you mentioned, and he has all these things laid out. Here's a question that I could not shake this week. Nehemiah is not a leader. He is a cupbearer. He is a very ordinary, low on the totem pole, Jewish exile, living in bonded labor. How in the world? I mean, you, you see him lay this out. Any of you, leader, anyone a leadership nerd like me, you like like business leadership podcasts and all organizational leadership? Just me? Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you, Freddie. You make me feel a little bit better here. Um, ne what Nehemiah does is he actually lays out smart goals. He has specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time-sensitive goals that he lays out there. It's like, how in the world did Nehemiah, the cupbearer, learn to deliver a master class in leadership? I could not shake that all week long. I'm like, what in the world? I'll tell you why. Because he had a really good leadership coach. God. And I feel like I was supposed to encourage somebody, like you might be sitting there and God has legitimately burdened your heart with a passion to see change. And he's even started formulating a plan, a vision, and ideas, and how it could change, and you're, and you're stuck at the man, but it's just little old me. What could I even do? What could I, here's the reality. It's not about, you remember last week, it's not about the size of the problem or the size of your leadership competence. It is about the size of your God. I'm preaching better than y'all are talking right now. <laughs> Nehemiah, he, he communicates with passion. He casts a compelling vision and a clear plan, and the king says, yes. Remember the analogy from last week? This is like you coming to your boss, and you're like, hey, I'm going to need like a 400% like a raise. And your boss is like, uh. And you're like, no, but let me tell you what it's for first. He's like, okay. It's for a pet project that has nothing to do with the company or organization, and by the way, you're going to need to hire someone else in my place that actually matters to the organization for me to be able to do that. What do you think? And your boss is like, sounds great. Let's do it. Like, this is crazy. This is otherworldly. And yet Nehemiah does not get it twisted when it comes to the key to his success. Nehemiah doesn't go home bragging about his superior communication and oration skills. He doesn't go home and tell his buddies about how good he can articulate and cast vision. And man, you got to see what I did, man. I, I did this pitch at Shark Tank. And man, you got to see what King Antaxerxes said. Like, this is how Nehemiah responds to this bizarre level of leadership success. Verse 8. He says, and because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Nehemiah has it clear from the very beginning. 
He knows, just like we articulate here at Greenhouse, the vision is a bunch of ordinary people like you and like me becoming passionate followers of Jesus, passionate servant leaders. And Nehemiah realizes, hey, listen, this is crazy. This is amazing, but it's not because I'm amazing. It's because it's God's hand was on me. It's because God's favor was on me. It's because it was God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, God's plan. Pull out your phone again on that same note if you've got it or whatever you're taking your notes on at this point. Online, you could do the same. And I want you to answer this question. What's the plan? What's the plan? Take a minute to just jot down anything that comes to mind. Maybe it's a single word. Maybe it's a, a specific thought. I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would begin to stir divine kingdom strategy in our hearts. I want you to go back and reference this during the week and kind of stay in that note a little bit. See if God drops anything in your heart. The whole thrust of this series is is really a prayer to God that he would use a bunch of ordinary people like us to to passionately follow Jesus, get his burden, his heart, his vision, his plan. But, But maybe you're tracking with me and you're like, Pastor John, like, Four months? I don't know if I can survive four more days with whatever situation. I, I don't know if I have that sort of persistent tenacity, patience, whatever it is. I'm not sure I could do that. It seems way too complicated. The problems seem too big. I'm not sure. So I, I want to break this down, make it super practical. When you walked in, you should have got one of these cards if you're in the room. It says local impact. I referenced that last week. You could take a look at that right now. If you're watching online, there's a little QR code that's going to pop up where you can see all of that same information is on our website. But I want to make this really practical. I want to drill down in this because it does, it can seem very theoretical. My hope is that we would not just be hearers of the word, we would actually do what it says. Here's the application point for this week. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to ask God for his burden, his heart, his vision, and his plan. I want us to ask God for his burden, his heart, And then keep pressing in. Don't stop at frustration. Don't stop at passion. Don't stop at at, at disenchantment. Press in for his vision and his plan. Why? Because you're really unqualified to lead until you have all four. If, If you've just got one, if you've got a burden and God's heart, you're like, come on, guys, and you're just leading based off of what you're against, but you don't even know where you're going, that's not called leadership. That's called wandering Everybody gets hurt. We need all four. His burden, his heart, his vision, his plan. Let me give you a few tangible examples. How many parents are in the room? Parents, one time, we made it, we survived. All right, older kids, younger kids. If you got young kids in the house, it's the Hunger Games up in that piece. We made it. You're like, man, okay, here's the burden. Pastor John, our house is a mess right now. Like, we're not having guests over, thank God, because it's the Rona right now, but thank God we don't have to because our house looks like an atomic bomb blew up. Like, stuff's everywhere. The house is in shambles. It's the, it's the workspace and the living space and the school space and the runaround space and the kids make messes space, and it is a mess. By the way, I'm reading a, a book on joy right now, and it talks about how cluttered spaces actually contribute to a loss of joy. Very fascinating psychology insight there. And so you're like, okay, um, there's all these arguments happening. We need more space and this burdens you that's your burden so here's a vision you're like okay from now on this is going to become a house of peace and joy this is going to become a house of peace and joy now you got a burden you're frustrated about something some holy discontent maybe a little bit of unholy discontent if we're being honest but it's mostly holy and you're like okay i got a vision now what's the plan step one you're going to talk as a family and you're going to pray and you're going to decide as a family, hey, guys, it's time for a change. Does the, mess, does the mess frustrate you? Yes, it frustrates me. It frustrates all of us. Okay, it's time for a change. Step two, you're going to declutter and reorganize. You're going to go through everything. Do we actually need this? Can we move some of this away? Can we create more breathing room? Can we, can we, can we give? Step three, you're going to pick things to sell and donate. You're going to go hit up Salvation Army and Goodwill. You're going to put in your microchurch group me. Hey, does anyone need an X, Y, or Z? You're going to declutter and deorganize, and now you've got space to breathe. By the way, that does not take four months. You can start on that this week. Let's say you've got a burden for the homeless. 
JC's got a burden for the homeless. So many in our church community have a burden for the homeless. Everyone has been hit hard in this season, to be clear, but especially the homeless community. You've got a burden for the homeless. You say, okay, here's here's the vision, Pastor John, as I've been praying, as I've been pressing in, that, that the homeless in our community know that they are seen and loved and not forgotten. And so here's my plan. We're gonna partner with Broward Outreach, one of our incredible faith-based local missions partners. We got a bunch of them, by the way, on this card. That's why I gave it to you to see a bunch of those organizations right there. And, And we're gonna help with chapels and outreaches and all sorts of stuff like that. You say, Pastor John, I've got a burden. I've got a passion for the next generation. I'm not sure if there's ever been a more difficult or confusing time to be a teenager than right now. God have mercy. You're like, here's a vision. I I wanna help ordinary students become passionate followers of Jesus. Now, here's the plan. I'm I'm gonna jump in. You heard JC mention it. We need more elementary leaders for our kids' church program. They're not doing spiritual babysitting. They're making disciples and it matters to Jesus. So it matters to us. Middle school needs more leaders right now. You're like, I'm gonna jump in with what's happening. Maybe you've got a burden for international missions. We are praying and looking right now for a missionary church planter for our Guyana crew that we love. By the way, Phil from Guyana made this. He designed this. Isn't that cool? We got our church family in Guyana adding all sorts of cool stuff to what we're doing here. Phil, good work, dude. You're like, man, God's stirring my heart. I'm gonna start pressing into that. I am praying that we would have a bunch of ordinary people like us who get God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, God's plan, God's burden, God's heart, God's vision, God's plan, and then step out like Nehemiah to say yes and see our world change. You're like, but amen, Pastor John, you're always peppy up there. Appreciate your enthusiasm. Like, it, it, it's me you're talking to. Like, do, do you realize it's, it's just me? Like, little old me. Like, what, what in the world could I ever do? You could be like Nehemiah and realize that it's not about the one who is called. It is about the one who is calling. See, the story of Nehemiah is not about the power of his vision, but the power of his God. I'm going to close it here, and we'll close in a final chorus in just a moment. But, but I want us to understand the parallel. See, Nehemiah, he... He held this high position. Nehemiah, yeah, you guys can come up. Nehemiah, he held a high position. He, he had this place of elevated status. He was an exile and he was a servant, but he had access to the king. And for him to step out, Nehemiah recognized, you see it over and over. The, the, the author, the writer reiterates it multiple times. I was afraid. I, I prayed to God. Why? Because Nehemiah realizes this will come at a cost to me. Maybe I survive, but I lose my job. Maybe I survive, but my family is in shambles. Maybe I survive, but it brings shame to my family for generations to come. Or maybe I lose my life. And then we look at Jesus, who held the highest position, who had proximity to the Father. He was with him in the very beginning. He was the God-man, and he leaves his place at great cost for the sake of the people that he loves because our walls were broken down, because our city lay in ruins. And I want to remind you of something. Maybe you're in a space right now where something has burdened your heart, where last week it didn't take you 34 minutes to get to the end of the sermon. You had an answer in two minutes. What breaks your heart? You're like, got it. And I feel like I'm supposed to remind you that it's, your heart is not breaking because you're such an incredible individual that you have come to this elevated status. Your heart is breaking because there is a God who made you and you've been created in his image and things that break your heart only break your heart because they are breaking his. If they matter in eternity, they matter to you because they matter to God. And I feel like I'm supposed to remind somebody and maybe you're watching online and you're in a spot where you're like, man, John, I even believe this in my head, but it doesn't feel real anymore. It's been a long time, if I'm being honest, since it felt real. Friend, he cares. He cares. The message of the gospel, the hope of the gospel is not that a bunch of human beings who have become so enlightened look out to the problems and say, we can do this because we can't. We created this mess but that we have a God in heaven who so loved you and he so loved me that he came. And he cares about the broken down walls in our world. And he cares about the broken down walls in our lives. And he cares about the hurt. And he cares about the pain. And he cares about the injustice. And he cares about the oppression. And he cares about the carnage that has been caused by sin in your life and the lives of people that you love. Where do you think your burden came from? It came from God. 
And if you will be employed with power to make any significant and lasting change, then it will only come through the one who gave you that burden in the first place, friends. We're not just activists and we're not just humanists. We're disciples who say Jesus fixed what was broken in me and I know he can fix what's broken in you. Come and see. Because friend, God doesn't just care. He can. He can bring about change. He can bring about restoration. He can rebuild. And he's calling a leader. Just like he called a Nehemiah back then, he is calling leaders right now. And maybe he's calling you. And I pray you'd respond. I pray you'd press in his burden, his heart, his vision, his plan. Because it all starts with him. Let's pray. You can bow your head and close your eyes just wherever you're at. If you're watching online or later on demand, just for a moment of quiet and privacy before God. I want us to give us a space to respond. If you're here and, and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, maybe you grew up in a religious background, maybe you grew up with no religious background, but something is stirring in your heart, letting you know this is true. I, I can't fix what's wrong on the inside and I can't fix what's wrong on the outside. In fact, I keep contributing to the problem that I hate. I need help. You do. And his name is Jesus and he's amazing and he's incredible and he is strong and he is competent and he loves you so much. If you're here and you want to invite Jesus in to restore, to rebuild on the inside, a rebuilding on the outside through us only happens as a result of re rebuilding on the inside that God does to us and in us. If you want him to come in, to rebuild, to repair right standing and connection with God, wherever you're at, I just want you to, in your heart, you don't have to yell at or scream it. God hears you wherever you're at. Just say, God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready. Even right there in the privacy of the room here, your bedroom, your living room, wherever you're watching from, say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, you're the way. You're the truth. You're the life. You're the, you're the leadership coach. You're, you're, you're the CEO. You're what I've been looking for. I don't even fully understand what that means yet, but I know it's true. Help me. Change me. Teach me. I want to follow you. Maybe you're here and you're already a follower of Jesus, but, but you've stopped at burden. You've stopped at passion. You have lived life, maybe it's been a few weeks, maybe it's been a few months, maybe it's been a few years or decades, and your life has been defined by what you're against with no plan or vision for what you're for. You're like, God, I, I hear you. If you're here this morning and you wanna move beyond burden, to get God's vision and God's plan. Wherever you're watching from right now, I just want you to, in your heart, say, God, speak. Speak, Lord. Your servant's listening. Here I am. Send me. Jesus, I say yes. You've got my attention. You've got my affection. You've got my heart. I say yes to you. You can look up at me for a moment. You can stand to your feet wherever you're at. We're gonna close in this song, but if you're joining us online, man, praying that, that if God's working in your heart, we'd love to come alongside of you on your faith journey. We'd love to, to walk with you. You can request prayer right there in the chat. You can text Jesus, myself, one of the other pastors. We'd love to connect with you. We will text you back. We all have access to that number. We'll call you if that's easier. We'd love to walk with you on your faith journey. Check out a microchurch. It's a space to grow and thrive. We pray God would bless you. Jesus' name.